Hello all. This is another very important episode of Doctor Talks, and today we have Doctor Alan Joseph Thomas. I'll introduce Alan Joseph Thomas, Doctor, to you. He is a MBBS and PGDM in family medicine from Christian Medical College, Bellore, and he is, you know, uh, just about to complete his MS in general surgery from CMC Ludhiana. He holds a certificate in innovation management from IBMI Berlin, Germany, and you know, I personally. no dr alan thomas for more than two decades dr alan thank you so much for agreeing to come and you know you know giving us a lot of insight into covid and you know especially the surgery surgery part and you know you know of covid and you know how patients can be treated and about some important facts that you're going to tell us today so uh, thank you so much for coming Thank you, Raja. It's a great pleasure to be uh, online here, and uh, definitely two decades. I agree, long, long time, and uh, we've been uh, old, good, good old friends. And yes, uh, Raja, thank you once again for doing so and for this wonderful introduction. Thank you, thank you. So we'll st- uh, straight away jump uh, to the questions. So you know, the first question is like in the current times. You know, we have seen that most medical facilities have been converted into COVID care facilities. You know, COVID centers, COVID hospitals, dedicated COVID centers. So, you know, what should a person do who needs, you know, like surgery? You know, in in this situation, you know, all the hospitals are COVID centers. So, what should a person do who's in need of some surgery? Uh, so, what what do you think about this? Yes, uh, I agree to you. Uh, you know, um, agree with you in the sense. you're saying uh, there are these hospitals that are converted to covid but yeah. if you see in a hospital setting um, um if it's a, a proper medical college a dedicated area would be given to covid and there would be a dedicated area for the non covid uh, works but these days uh, the patients who need surgery or uh, uh, any emergency related surgeries uh, what happens is they undergo a covid test and based on that uh, they decide whether the patient should uh, get the surgery done under the covid side or the non covid side so yes uh, if you see look at the pandemic a lot of hospitals have been totally converted to covid but there are areas there are hospitals which do non covid surgeries also and uh, the non covid surgeries in this pandemic is usually the emergency surgeries that uh, uh, that can be done and the regular surgeries are on hold at at present Okay. Okay. Yes. So, so you know these regular surgeries, uh, you know, which are on at hold for the present. Does that, you know, cost something to the patient? Cost as in, is it having some harmful effect for the patient if they delay this surgery or like, what do you think about this? Yes, I would take an example. Uh, for example, gallstones. That is the stones in the gallbladder. Yeah. A patient is usually having it for say about six months, one year. So even if he waits for about a couple of months. uh and he's mind you he's totally asymptomatic at present yeah uh so he can wait but if he develops any complications you know uh, per, per, uh pertaining to his uh condition if he develops complications then that becomes an emergency so there are these routine surgeries and the emergency surgeries so a okay. surgeon decides whether the patient can wait or not for example a, a hernia which is not obstructed or a hernia which is not doing anything your patient is carrying it for a hydrocele is carrying it around for 10 years maybe for a six more months if he carries it around it should not be a problem no going into a surgery in a pandemic is definitely a serious concern in terms of life and uh, also the prognosis of the patient okay 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 great great thank you so much for you know for informing all the viewers about you know what how the decision is to be made and how the surgeon will take the decision for the best of the person uh, for the best of uh, uh, the results for a particular person who needs surgery so doctor we'll go to the but next but i would like sorry to cut yeah. you yeah, no but problem. i would like to um, add a couple of points more here that any routine surgery in this pandemic needs to be avoided okay and uh, because covid i'm going to you know in my further talk i'm going to tell how it is going to uh, you know why you need to avoid these situations and uh, these routine surgeries need to be avoided because a routine surgery can get complicated under the setting of a pandemic absolutely absolutely so definitely absolutely. this needs to be uh, you know really set in but if the patient has any symptoms you know even a semi emergency he should uh visit the doctor and uh, you know seek medical opinion at the earliest rather than wait till the complication worsens and then uh, do it 
So the most important thing that you have told us regarding this uh, is that the person has to consult a doctor and let the doctor take a call rather than the person taking a call on this. Is that right, Dr. Allen? Yes. Yeah. Yes, a doctor will decide whether this patient needs to be operated at present or can he wait. Again, the patient has to give the correct symptoms and uh, the exactly should not hide any information. Sometimes, you know, to get the surgeries done, the patient uh, gives false information and okay. then intra-op, we end up having a lot of troubles. Absolutely. absolutely. So that should be avoided. A patient uh, and the doctor should have a face-to-face -face conversation, a clear conversation, and really uh, both of them should, uh, you know, get to one line and decide whether this uh, uh, needs to be done at present or not. So give the option to the patient at the end okay. of it. Okay. But uh, if it's a routine surgery, uh, the doctor can wait. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, we'll uh, thank you for, you know, enlightening us on this particular question. The second question that I wanted to ask you is, uh, you know, latest thing that is going on, that is this black fungi, you know, so there's a rising concern about this black fungi uh, mucormycosis in COVID patients. Can you tell us about it and what can be done to prevent this condition? Um, mucormycosis uh, is a, uh, actually a fungi and it was be, it's been there since time immemorial. It's only that in COVID situation, it's now, you know, taken a lot of highlight. A lot of patients are coming down with this uh, black fungi and it's, it, it's a very uh, bad prognosis. And how it affects is it's actually in those patients who are immunocompromised. Yeah. And COVID uh, has, as you know, a lot of, has to, uh, has to do a lot with immunity. So when yeah. the patient's immunity goes yeah. down or there are comorbidities of the patient like diabetes, hypertension, uh, it's seen more commonly in patients with diabetes, this fungi gets into the airway and then uh, creates, uh, then starts growing there and starts slowly spreading to the brain, the eye, the orbit. And what happens because of which the patient starts getting headaches uh, you know, uh, vision disturbances, diplopia, that is, you see two, uh, two, two things at the same time. So all these are the effects on the fungus. And most of the time, these are irreversible. However, uh, these can be controlled when the sugars uh, in uh, these patients are controlled, uh, early antibiotics, anti-fungal uh, therapy, the long-term fungal uh, therapy that needs to be uh, taken. So the progression of the disease can be uh, stopped or reduced. Absolutely. And uh, as, as we all know, in uh, COVID, a lot of patients get steroids. Of course, uh, we are weighing, uh, do, uh, seeing the risks versus benefits ratio to protect the lung, to you know, uh, get proper effects, we are using steroids. Steroids itself will uh, lower down the immunity of the patient. And then uh, with the use of steroids, the sugars, it's all linked. The sugars also will get shot up, use of steroids. So when the sugars get shot up, the diabetes becomes uncontrolled. There you go, black fungi, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in the air and you inhale the spores and then uh, you get the disease. So you're saying that it's an opportunistic, opportunistic infection, which was there since time immemorial. And you know, like uh, it to so the doctor, you know, who's giving steroids and you know, uh, and the current immuno immunity, the, the, the patient is immunocompromised. So, you know, in this conditions, he's very prone to getting this black fungi, but it can be yes. prevented by a doctor, you know, when they have proper, uh, you know, because it's in the air, I don't think a lot of environmental effect, uh, environmental control can be there. But from the point of view of giving the medicines to the patient, this can be controlled. Is that right, doctor? Yes, you see, we can't totally stop giving steroids. Otherwise, yeah. you might end up losing the patient itself. Absolutely. So Absolutely. again, the doctor has to weigh the risks versus benefits and a uh, patient needs to be pre informed that about the side effects of the medicines that we use. Okay. So he has to be in the loop and uh, he has to be informed about all these uh, possible complications. Okay. And so mucormycosis definitely is a, uh, can be considered as one of the COVID complications, which can be life-threatening if not controlled. So there have been uh, cases where, you know, uh, this uh, is, uh, you know, in the, it's just in the bud and the patient is discharged, but by the time he goes home, uh, then, you know, it flares up once he's in the, and then he comes back with severe headache and loss of vision. And at the same time, this uh, black fungi needs to be treated by uh, multiple teams. That is like a multi-modality treatment. So here, as we said, uh, it's in the sinus, it gets in, uh, infected, infects the sinus, grows there, 
So the ENT team gets involved when it affects the brain, the neurologists get involved. Uh, and uh, definitely ENT may, uh, need, depending upon the condition of the patient, may need to do a wash of the sinus to clear out, uh, you know, uh, literally uh, plucking out these uh, fungus and then uh, inst uh, give antifungals uh, for a long. So medicine, ENT, neurologist. So uh, it's a multi-modality treatment if a patient gets infected with uh, black fungi or mucormycosis. Yeah, that, that's, that's a lot of information that you have given to all our viewers. I think they're all... Uh, perfectly enlightened about this uh, black fungi problem. So I'll go to the next question, Dr. State away. In the so why are patients with comorbidities? You know, we've all, been, all always seen you know, old patients, copy people, patients with comorbidities, why are they at a greater risk of severe COVID disease or even a you know risk of uh, death? What is this thing with comorbidities and COVID? Okay. So with this, if you see uh, there are two patients. One is a patient without comorbidities and one is a patient with comorbidities. Now, what do we mean by comorbidities? The added medical problems or previous surgical problems that he had. So those comorbidities actually add on to the risks of uh, the COVID disease. So the, the virus, which is quite strong, I would say in uh, layman terms, it can infect anyone, whether now we see that even the pediatric population is getting infected. So it can infect anybody, right, from the pediatric to the young to the old age. But however, if you see the younger population versus the older population, the percentage of the uh, you know, patients who are getting, uh, you know, having uh, going to the sicker side is the elderly population. It's the uh, patients with comorbidities who are getting affected. Now, that is like you buy a brand new car. Yeah. You know, I'm just trying yeah. to uh, get into a layman term. You buy a brand new car. So the brand new car is expected to run about five to six years without giving troubles. But once a car or, a, uh, you know, gets into the workshop, you know, starts giving engine trouble, then it can break down at any point of time, right? Absolutely. So it's like any heart disease. Now let's look at the comorbidities, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension all that you know is affecting the body it's yeah. reducing the immunity yeah. of the body it's um, it's like an add-on factor that the patient can get uh, even more sicker with these comorbidities however Absolutely. mind you there are patients with the comorbidities who are you know uh, getting well also Absolutely. it's not that Absolutely. if you have diabetes that's the end of the road if you have hypertension heart disease that is the end of the road no so it's not to lose hope but definitely these need to be under control and any symptoms or any symptoms of COVID, what do people do now? They usually sit at home for five days, see if they, it is uh, because of something else. Later, once the SPO2 starts dropping, they rush to the hospital. Absolutely. But I would say Absolutely. in these patients with comorbidities, okay. catch them early. Yeah. Catch them early. Any yeah. symptoms, get hold of a doctor, at least by online chat, let the doctor uh, figure out what exactly is going on and then start off early medications, start off early uh, care so that the patient does not go into this severe form of the disease. Okay. Okay. But Absolutely. again, if a patient has comorbidities, he is likely, I'm not saying you know all of them 100%, but there's a percentage of the patients uh, having problems with comorbidities uh, show a severe COVID disease. Okay, okay. Compared to patients with uh, yeah, uh, the younger population or patients without comorbidities. So, yes, yeah, so you've perfectly answered. The immunity is better. Perfectly answered the question, and with all the questions and with all the future steps and all the uh, steps that can be taken to have these comorbid patients relatively safer, you know, uh, so that in this current pandemic situation. Next question, Dr. Allen, specifically because you're an expert in surgery. And, you know, because of your exp expertise in surgery, you know, uh, there is this uh, the part of the hospital which is always open. That is the trauma of the hospital. Now, the trauma of the hospital is where accident patients are taken. So, you know, if a patient may require immediate surgery, what is the risk in performing emergency services where timing is crucial? Yes, this is something that we uh, face on an everyday basis. So, in case of trauma, uh, you know, patients sometimes require emergency surgeries like liver injuries, spleen injury, the bubble gets perforated, or, you know, head injuries for more commonly patients, people not wearing helmets, head injury. So where immediate surgery is required, definitely the patient needs to go for surgery. Now, we as doctors literally cannot wait 
uh, or say, okay, come back after two weeks, if in case he turns back as COVID positive, you know, there are a lot of asymptomatic positives roaming around. So, in case he turns out to be, uh, we can't say you go back home to two weeks, come back after quarantine. No, we can't say that. We might have to operate that patient immediately. So, uh, both the patient is at risk and definitely the surgeon who's operating is both at risk. So, both have to take adequate measures to uh, uh, do the surgery. So, as doctors, what we do is we go in like a proper, with a proper gear and uh, PPE kit and everything, of, uh, take all precautions, do only surgery that is exactly required to sustain life. We don't do extensive surgeries, just emergency surgeries that reduce the time of surgery. So if you do just the surgery part uh, that is just required to sustain life and then come back later if required, you know, with most of the time, one, uh, one shot surgery is uh, all right. But what happens in patients with trauma? They have an orthopedic surgery, broken bones. They have an abdominal surgery, say a head injury. So he might require multiple surgeries or multiple teams. So again, the operating time increases. So the important thing is fix what is important at that particular time to save the life of the patient as well as the limb of the patient. Thank you. And yes, uh, and yes, uh, the risk of performing the surgery is definitely uh, high, and uh, both the surgeon and the patient is at risk. But mind you, the patient, why, why is it at risk? I just would like to say that uh, these surgeries are usually done under general anesthesia, and as we know, the COVID affects the lungs. So general anesthesia is by gas. So anything in you are giving into an infected lung, definitely. Uh, the recovery will be slower. Why? To bring him out of the ventilator in case of a non-COVID patient or a normal patient, to bring him out of the ventilator is going to take time. His lungs are already infected or already weak in a COVID-positive patient. But uh, we try to do uh, what, the, what needs to be done in an emergency setting. Okay, absolutely. And you know, related to this particular question is our question related to infection control and the risk of person getting infection while the surgery happens. So at the time of COVID, how can we prevent nosocomial or hospital acquired infection, especially COVID infection in people who have come for non-COVID surgeries? Okay, in many places, uh, they have, government have st uh, stopped uh, the routine surgeries till the pandemic is over. So right now in Punjab also, we are not doing any uh, routine surgery, especially in this hospital. We're not doing any non-emergency surgeries as directed by the government. So once the government clears, once the pandemic is slightly on the lower side, they will reopen semi uh, these non-routine surgeries. So routine surgeries have been stopped by the government at many places to uh, curve the pandemic because we know that in non-COVID patient tests, no, uh, says, uh, I mean, uh, tests as non-COVID, uh, it does not have COVID infection and he undergoes surgery. He's in the same hospital as the COVID patients are. However, even though you say they have demarketed areas, there are always relatives who go out and come back and visit the patient. They go into the uh, general public, then come back and visit the patient. So they can be carriers of infection. Absolutely. So avoid uh, routine surgeries. So routine surgeries can get complicated under the COVID settings. And definitely uh, the visit to the hospitals by these patients who can be managed online or uh, you can get to, get to a doctor online. Uh, if not much problems, he should sit at home Avoid coming to the hospital because hospitals are hot spots of COVID-19 infection. So why go into the fire when you already know there's a fire there? But at the same time, Dr. Allen, you know, when you spoke about hospitals being hotspot, I think they are the most controlled hotspots because in the hospitals, uh, you know, there are a lot of people with COVID infection, but at the same time, there's a maximum precaution to prevent infection also. Whereas in a normal yes. public setting, in a normal public setting, there might be a lot of COVID patients, but there's no uh, precaution in sight or no mechanism in sight to actually prevent the infection. So though, yes, yes there are hotspots, but actually they are the most controlled hotspot. Do you agree with me when I say that? Yes, I agree with you. In most of the hospitals, they have demarcated, as I already mentioned, COVID and the non-COVID areas. But what happens is definitely there can be some sort of cross infection, no matter how you how much prevention you take, it may not be the hospital people, a person who is a relative who's just gone to the canteen, where canteen is not COVID and non-COVID, canteen is a general place, you know, a canteen or a hotel outside. There are a lot of patients or uh, relatives of the other people also who 
you know asymptomatic positives do also come in so he can carry the infection and then he can nicely walk into uh the non covid area there are no tests like you know every time you walk in or walk out you're not absolutely. doing a rapid rapid absolutely. test absolutely so yeah. he can be a carrier for infection and definitely people in the non covid areas can get infected by that one person who has gone into the public got carried infection and then come back so so you you enlightened us you know a lot about this uh, uh, infection control in hospitals so you know there's a small little question that is one of the last questions that we have for today is that you know regarding this uh, new thing that has come up not a new thing actually but a complication that you know people have started to notice very well is clotting of blood so you know is clotting of blood actually as you would say we will if you do certify it to be a covid complication and how do we identify the symptoms of clot of this clotting of blood okay yes uh, covid 19 infection has reported uh, a lot of uh, patients you know in a lot of patients having uh, clotting of blood especially in the lower limbs and uh, the areas where they're dependent so now how does that actually bring in so patients if you see uh, if a patient has covid 19 infection he is having severe myalgia he just wants to lie down flat on the bed bed and what happens is when you don't move or you are immobilized uh, and especially in patients who are seen more in patients who are ventilated in on ventilator dependent so uh, patients on ventilator they are in the supine position or prone position like that uh, for some time so what happens wherever there is stasis of blood and given this covid 19 infection there are uh, there is clotting of blood that is seen especially in the lower limbs so what happens now how do you identify those so if it's in the hospital setting the doctor is always round the clock there he just notice a change in the limb color a uh, limb is white or pale there's no blood supply there's uh, the, the, there's venous thromboembolism that is more uh, that's the scientific term that they use the venous vte venous thromboembolism so what happens so that particular limb gets becomes cold there is uh, pallor this uh, uh, change in temperature so so we see that in those uh, patients who are uh, intubated or on long term uh, on the beds and what happens in that is the clot can actually travel to different parts of the body the clot can get dislodged because the blood circulation is continuously having the blood is not stopping but there are certain areas and uh, there is stasis of blood the clot is formed but the the blood will push that clot into the lungs can push it into the heart into the brain that's why we see a lot of stroke cases in covid because there's a sudden onset uh, clot that has uh, you know moved into the uh, vessel uh, supplying the brain and uh, there's a facial palsy so uh, i would advise you know people at home even see even mild infection moderate infection there are uh, signs and symptoms of uh, clotting now how do we identify that any facial drooping any slurring of speech any sudden onset breathing difficulty he was talking and suddenly he has breathing difficulty pulmonary embolism is a possibility uh, oh. clot moving from the oh, leg yeah. to the lung and not supplying the lung so um, what happens so all these symptoms any of these symptoms any breathing difficulty uh, facial deviation slurring of speech stroke like symptoms change in color of the limb uh, sudden onset pain severe pain paresthesia that is any i can't feel my hand or leg um, immediately uh, visit the doctor and uh, preferably a vascular surgeon but many places do not have a vascular surgeon in place so the general doctors also the uh, do treat uh, clotting and how do we do that they use low molecular weight heparins as prophylaxis for patients who are admitted they are on heparin or uh, low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis so that again that cannot be administered at home um, because there of certain risks of bleeding if you don't know how to titrate the dose if you don't know how to uh, give it properly you can end up you know these are anticoagulants that you're giving you can end up causing a bleed when you're trying to cre- uh, stop a clot you end up reversing and causing a bleed so all these injections need to be uh, given under uh, doctor supervision yeah. absolutely absolutely so absolutely. that is how it is that you know so we have covered a lot of ground today dr allen you know we have covered you know uh, respect to you know non covid surgeries we have covered black fungi we have covered comorbid patients we have covered trauma patients we you also spoke about nosocomial infections and finally you spoke about blood clot i think that was a lot of information uh, that you know has brought you know shed light to this uh, some questions which people just have doubts about and they have to rely on normal google searches or you know whatsapp forwards and in the time of whatsapp forwards and unverified news 
doctors giving out verified information because of their qualification is a boon and we really really thank you for sharing this information sharing this you know information which is verified which is pure and which is going to help the people with all of us and you know i also want to take this opportunity you know to thank you as a healthcare worker as a doctor you have been working round the clock you know i'm i know you have very long shifts in the covid wards last time when i was speaking to you you were fully covered in the pp kit with the shield and all that you know i'm sure it feels really hot and terrible inside that pp kit but you know even having that on you guys work for very long hours so thank you on the behalf of all the viewers on the behalf of the country uh, thank you for working so hard to keep us safe thank you mr raja for doing this uh, really happy that you have come up with this venture yeah. and uh, hope to you know be more used to the society thank you thank you so much doctor